Hello, I'm Chris Slisher, and welcome to Turning of the Wheel, an intelligent, lively discussion about astrology, art, and spiritual adventure. Timing is everything, and as the great wheel turns, we are best prepared when we are best informed. Join me as I explore concepts that allow us to broaden our view of the world. You'll hear interesting topics, meet fascinating guests, and discover who you really are. Using the time-tested practices of astrology, you'll learn how to accept change as the great wheel of life turns. Astrology, art, and spiritual adventure on Turning of the Wheel TV with Chris Flisher. Hello, and welcome to Turning of the Wheel. My name is Chris Flisher. As you know, this is a show about astrology, one of my favorite topics of all. And uh, today I've got a great guest on. Her name is Ariel Goodman, and she's from the West Coast. And she's here to talk about her book, which we did in a, in a, a former earlier segment, but also we're going to talk about Venus star rising and the geometry of astrology. So welcome to Turning of the Wheel, Ariel. Great to see you. Thank you, you Chris. So nice to be here. Yeah, I'm great. So happy that you were able to come and, and be here with us. Yeah, um, thank you. So when I was looking through your book, Venus star rising, I was amazed at the, the mathematical geometry behind the logic of the astrology. Now, I've always understood the logic of astrology. I've always understood that mathematics was a huge piece of it. But what fascinates me is in particular, with Venus in particular as a planet, the sequence with which it rotates around in its, in its orbit creates a mathematical precision that is used in almost every form of art. And mm -hmm. I'd love to have you tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, well, Chris, or nature for that matter. it fascinated me too. Yeah. Okay, so um, the five-pointed star of Venus is equivalent to a nautilus shell, uh -huh, okay. to a lot of seashells, but let's so say the nautilus. So maybe we have a photo of the nautilus. Can we see yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. We, yeah okay. And everybody will recognize the nautilus shell mm -hmm. because it's, it's an iconic image, and just as Venus is an iconic image, you know the painting by Botticelli of Venus, the birth of Venus, where she's floating to the shore on a seashell. Yeah. So it's interesting that the mythology of Venus from Homer and Hesiod, the birth of Venus, floating, came floating to the shore on a shell, and then Botticelli painted it in 1500 or something, and then. Um, but the real truth of it is Venus's orbit, which we didn't really prove scientifically until probably the 19th or 20th century, is that she actually, that orbit of Venus it, and Earth is equivalent to the same frequency mathematically as if you were to break down the proportions or the ratio of a nautilus shell, it is the same exact thing. So this is the mathematical precision. Mm -hmm. This is a, 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 a measurement. Right. 1.6 right. is the measurement. Right. It's 1.6 because the orbit of Venus to Earth is 1.6. The orbit of Venus is 584 days. Earth is 365 days. And when you divide one by the other, you come up with the 1.6. Got it. And there's a lot of other 1.6 um, in the orbit around the star, the five-pointed star in eight years makes 1.6. The musical scale makes 1.6, which Venus is really a part of. There are five, uh, or is it eight? Um, yeah, five black keys and eight white keys on a musical scale. Um, there are all kinds of um, artists, designers, architects, mathematicians, um, creators, etc., that photographers that use they that what you've probably heard of is the golden mean. The golden mean, yeah, the golden mean, the golden ratio, and the golden section are all the same. It's that one one point six measurement, which we see in almost every form of art. We see it in nature as well. We see it in pine cones, we see it in the nautilus shells. We see it in flower blossoms, beehives, beehives, uh, any number of things have this. Um, have this. So this shows that there is a mathematical contingency, mathematical connection, logic to this same pattern, right, which right, is just amazing. Right. To me, which really sort of substantiates the fact that the universe really is is a mathematical construct. It's the unfolding. What I've come to see about it, because this is what Venus and this Earth dance is, it's the unfolding of organic life because the star itself is a fractal that reaches out and can create another star. Once It's like one star attracts another and they hook up and then it attracts another and then another and it just keeps growing and growing and growing and it never ends. And so it's that 
It's that attraction magnetism principle mm -hmm. that's present in it. It's the um, mating principle, the life-giving principle. Each star point of Venus takes 9.2 months from one to the next, and that's the human life the gestation cycle. development yeah. cycle. Wow. <coughs> so these things all connect, and I find that to be fascinating. And it's they, when Botticelli or any of the people who were designing these famous buildings and these pieces of art, they probably didn't recognize that, or didn't maybe didn't know that that was based on the Fibonacci sequence, which is part of the of the, what's called what determines the golden sequence mm -hmm. and the golden section. But well, they knew it was something. They knew it was something because it's, it's they didn't present. call it maybe Fibonacci until Fibonacci came along and really I <coughs> identified it. Right. But the Vitruvian Man was was um, an image that Leonardo da Vinci brought back in the Renaissance. And that's basically the way we look if we stand with our arms out and our legs out. That's what's called yeah. the Vitruvian right. Man. That's the symbol right. that you see in all those old architecture books Exactly. Of Leonardo da Vinci. Because the body, the human body, is all made out of phi ratio. And that's what uh, Leonardo da Vinci was fascinated with, the human body. And so he would measure like the ratio between the hand and the whole arm, or the oh. this part of the arm to up to the shoulder, or between the lips and the to the whole forehead, and uh, I mean he had broke it down into so many different uh, ways, but it all came down to that 0. 0.6 or 1.6, which was th this perfect repetitive, harmony. So repetitive. the human being is actually a part of this five-pointed star, you yeah. know. And what I love about it is that there's this point in time where. These are all smaller components, like you mentioned, of the, the arm, the hand to the arm is a 1.6. Right. And then you take the arm to the rest of the body, it's 1.6. So this is a formula that keeps recurring throughout all of nature. And it's tied to the, the, the transit and the cycle of Venus, the planet, which is the planet that represents beauty in astrology. Right. Which is just a, a fascinating, it's, it's a startlingly accurate, right. precise point that just if you don't believe in astrology, this will make you believe in astrology because the precision is so crisp, you, you can't deny it. And then I realized, as working with this five-pointed man or woman, star, Vitruvian figure, Venus figure now, is that, um, so we have our arms outstretched and we have our legs and we have our head, but at the end of each of those is five fingers on each arm five toes on each leg, and five senses. So there is again the fractal of the five, and then more five, and then who knows what else, right. how, that, how that radiates out into, uh, into the universe. It, 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 it does speak to a master plan, <laughs> <laughs> if nothing else. Yes, right. As if there's right. somebody is in charge here who has a master plan, depending upon your persuasion in that regard. Um, but I find it to be fascinating because it has such that great precision. And you mentioned the word phi before, P-H-I. That is the Greek word, or the, mm -hmm. is it the Greek word for the golden mean, or mm -hmm. the golden ratio, mm -hmm. or the golden section. So golden mm -hmm. ratio, golden mean, golden section are all the same. Mm -hmm. It's all the, just different words. Right. But it refers to that 1.6 um, sequence right. of the Fibonacci numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. Phi is a Greek letter, yes, but it it's is. also a Greek number. We have a lot of words in English that have phi in it. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, it's also an, uh, a number, a value, a mathematical value, and um, it's also, I think, in the Greek alphabet, there are, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the letters of the Greek alphabet actually are not just letters. They all have, uh, there, there's an energy frequency. They're, they're frequencies. Right. So they mean more than just... They have a harmonic quality. Right, yes. exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think the Hebrew alphabet is like this too. Like if people that have studied the Kabbalah, you know, each of these uh, letters that represent the different pathways or gates or portals or whatever are energy centers. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ancient knowledge that was already embedded in certain things that just um, in our modern times we've kind of let go and forgotten about. But I think now we're able to go back to looking at some of these things because we have the computer technology and the scientific abilities to study things in much more minute detail. Yeah, than that we makes ever a huge have. difference. And I think that when we recognize this, we really get to that point where I was mentioning earlier that there is a logic to all of this, to the universe, which is stunning because it just brings into into play so much of explains so many things. I think. Right. And that's, 
having that explanation, I think, really gives me, you know, it gives me reason to, to live. I think mm -hmm. I, it's very mm -hmm. heartening to have that kind of knowledge out there. When I think it's also why we love Venus so much, mm -hmm. because it is that, it, because that, if that value really does speak to something called harmony, a principle called harmony, don't, don't we all want to be harmonious? That would be the goal, yes. <laughs> I mean, don't we want to live in a harmonious world? Yeah. Don't we want to be peaceful in our lives? Don't we want to feel like we're in the flow? Absolutely, we do. It's also that frequency is the frequency of synchronicity. You know how you always say, gee, I can't believe that happened. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Or what we call coincidence. But right. Coincidence is, is really synchronicity. It's really synchronicity. And synchronicity, in a, in a sort of a, a summing up phrase, is when events occur that seem implausible or seem unlikely to have occurred because they're like, how did that happen? Right. And boom, it's right. there, right? Right, exactly. And, that is, and, and Carl Jung did a great deal of work on that. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of an intersection. It's an intersection of you in a, at a certain point in time and space where you, where you get to that intersection where that kind of thing happens. But if you look again at that figure of the Nautilus shell, and that's the Fibonacci sequence, and maybe to explain that to your audience, I mean, a lot of people have heard of the Fibonacci sequence, but they don't really know what it is. Okay, it was defined by a man named Fibonacci, but what it's based on is just a simple set of numbers you start with zero and you go to the next value which is one okay and then you add zero and one together and you get two and you add one and two together you get three so you're always looking behind you at the last number that you were just at and add yourself to that and you create the next number so then the sequence goes to five eight thirteen 21, And then 34. When, you, when you plot those points on a, yes. on a graph, you start connecting them, right. you can see the same right. cycle occur. Right, and I think we have a graphic um, of that, the, of that the we've cycle. shown yeah, of so. that. Yeah. 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 yeah, right. Yeah, there yeah. you go. See, there that's, it is, yeah. 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. So that's the organic unfoldment of this particular seashell, but that's the Fibonacci sequence, and that has been identified with not only how nature works and how we grow as human beings and life cycles repeat and so and how we expand but the whole evolutionary plan is is that so we're all spiraling out on that same sequence right right exactly and so and and one of the things about astrology which i always find interesting is that is that we are always history does repeat itself we do have these cycles that recur and we see mm -hmm. them recurring what happens is that they recur at a different place in time. So it's like a giant Helios or a corkscrew where a, an event will happen and then they'll go around the, the, as time moves forward, it's going in a circular time motion like that. Events will reoccur, not at the same place, at the same time, but not in the same place. And when the place changes, all the circumstances change. So we mm -hmm. can see this in history. When they say history repeats itself, this is what they're referring to. Mm -hmm. It does, yes. But I think the fascinating thing for me about discovering that sequence and connecting it to Venus was that, again, it synced m me up and my life up. I like, I like to follow the rhythm of Venus in my own life. Every 9.2 months, it changes star points, which means it's, it's, it's usually going from a yin sign to a yang or a yin phase to a yang. And the, so we're, we're, it's the heartbeat of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. It's really, so being in sync with that, like what element is it in? What, you know, we, we go from Gemini, uh, more, more recently we went from Gemini as an evening star to Aries as a morning star. And then it'll go to Capricorn as so an evening star. So when that star. happens, it, it brings along the, the attributes of that sign that it's right. in. So if you're in an Aries sign, you're being a very aggressive, you're right. being right. activated. You're well, the whole world is kind of operating under that. You know, we have the planets operating all the time, and everybody's looking at the planets and what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But in the background, behind the planets, we have this very slow-moving Venus clock that is just kind of ticking away a very slow, slow mechanism that's moving in the background, and every now and then, again, principle of synchronicity, it syncs up with where 
a planet is or was it a very important point in your own chart and it allows that feeling of wow I was in the right place at the right time to have these circumstances And that happen. works in both good and bad, you could say. I suppose there are probably times when people wonder that they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yes, exactly. Of course. But I think being in tune with this and knowing where these points are in your life allows you to uh, be more cognizant. I think people have to be, I've always found that if you're more attuned to the possibility of synchronicity, that they are more likely to occur. I think that we are not always aware of them sometimes. In the, in, and, and the types of events that can happen through synchronicity may appear to be minor, but they actually are um, uh, um, implore a larger meaning behind them. Mm -hmm. Don't you think there seems to be a, yeah. and I think that you have to be, a, have to have a little antenna up that says, looking for uh, synchronistic events. Mm -hmm. And then when they occur, they're just yeah. phenomenal. And then we want more. It's yeah. kind of like, okay, I liked that. Do that again. Hit me with that one again. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it really is a fascinating, uh, if anybody's ever had a, you'll know what a synchronistic event is. It is, uh, I always give the example, supposing you're at a party and you meet somebody and they talk talking about a book or whatever, you recommend, you make a mental note of the book and then you disappear and you don't, and you go across country to a different part of the world and then somebody who you've never met before mentions the same book and you say, wow, that's a synchronistic event. Two different people, I always think it has to be two extraneous sequences or events that come together and boom to create the synchronistic event. You pay attention. That's a mm -hmm. very simplistic idea, my, uh, my example rather, very simplistic uh, example, but still it does give the idea of coincidence. Mm -hmm. Coincidences are good things to have happen, typically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're on. Or it, I, I like the rule of three with mm -hmm. synchronicity. You're reading a book, and this has happened to me a few times. You're reading, I'm reading a passage in a book, and the next day I find myself in a very, s almost playing out the same scene in my life that oh. I just read about in the book the night before. And then a third thing happens where I'm someplace else and somebody mentions, oh, my friend was telling me they were reading this book and it's the same book you just read and that you just played out and now you've heard it a third time and then you have to wonder, wait a minute, Right, this and when they happen, they they are <laughs> they are thrilling. They like, they are very thrilling. Right, and that you think is also tied to the Fibonacci number and this sort of this sequence of events and times, and it's sort of that yes. clock-like precision of these. Yeah, and the Venus star is attuned to that cycle. Mm. Yeah, I don't. I know that people that work in the financial markets use the Fibonacci sequence of numbers to because they have determined that the markets work that way because uh, if organic well, life <laughs> well yeah if you know how to use it I mean if organic life works that way if we grow and expand and if rivers flow in and forests grow in and leaves on a tree and flowers unfold and bloom in that phi ratio pattern or Fibonacci sequence then it, it really is organic life Right. So what would you use for the, 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 the determining factors for that? When would you say the beginning is and then a year and a, a 1.6 uh, later it will occur? What would you use for some sort of a major uh, beginning or a demarcation of some sort? like a Well, in Venus's case, it is every 1.6 years, and that is phi. Mm -hmm. I mean, that simply is phi, 1.6. Well, 1. I guess what I'm saying is, when would you, what would be the determining factor? What, what determines a the Venus, start? Venus, well... When Venus begins to go retrograde, she, and which she does every 1.6 years, mm -hmm. she is slowing down in her orbit, and now at the middle part of the retrograde, like halfway between the beginning and end of the retrograde, she meets with Earth in an exact conjunction or very close conjunction called Kazemi to create a right. star point. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the seed is planted for the beginning of that 1.6 okay. year cycle that will take you to the next 1.6 so years So it's the Kazemi now. that is the secret. That's the Kazemi. The, that's, the, that's the beginning right. point, which is I when think so. the sun and Venus are exactly aligned. From my research, I mean, I, I think that it's possible that other people will tell you that it's at the beginning of the retrograde or it's at another t oh. point in time because it doesn't really matter where you measure it from. Mm -hmm. um, 
Do you know the author Greg Braden? Have you ever read I any of not, his no. books? It's okay. Doesn't ring a bell. So he wrote something on fractal to called Fractal Time, which is a beautiful book, and he talked about Venus in the 1.6 cycle. But he was actually suggesting that you can take any important event in your life that's happened, like take the most important, most extraordinary event of your life and figure out exactly how old you were, how many years, how many months. And then you can add a 1.6 equivalent to it and you're likely to get another really big important event 1.6 from that. Wow. And then you keep going 1.6 from that. So it does keep expanding. 584 it's days. not always 584, but based on that graphic you were showing earlier of the numbers, remember uh -huh. the five, the eight, the 13, and there it is, the 21. Yeah. Right. So when you're when you're looking at those numbers, uh, he's got the instructions in the book. I can't tell you. He wasn't timing it exactly from Venus retrograde to Venus retrograde the way that I do. So it works in it works in a lot of different ways. This Venus synchronization mechanism is finely tuned like a like a the most incredibly programmed Swiss clock. It is, it is so precise. It's measuring clock, yeah. on different mm -hmm. levels. And now I'm calling it actually the Venus clock. This Venus star, uh, when I first got all this information and wrote it down, it, it, it is, still is a Venus star because it's a five-pointed star. But the way it moves is it is like a slow-moving clock working in the back, backdrop of our life always clicking away. And those synchronistic events, I think, are important. So I think knowing these points in an individual astrology chart in your own personal life is uh, irrelevant because it can be moments of great decisions and moments of great progress, moments of great discovery, moments of great creation, creativity. Mm -hmm. And to be cognizant of them, I think, would be really helpful. And that's what you do when you do your Venus star uh, rising sign uh, readings. Mm -hmm. You'll get that mm -hmm. sort of information. Mm -hmm. The people would get that information from Ariel based on their particular birth time, because there are moments when you're going to have these points hitting. Now, an interesting point I want to make is, or ask about, is when you do this, does the, where we are in the world have a specific attribute to your own personal chart? So if you are in a Venus star, you have your Venus star chart, and a, a point comes up where the sun goes over that, or a major planet goes over that point, is it activated in mm -hmm. that? It is, mm -hmm. okay, interesting. Yeah, so, for instance, maybe you'll look at your birth chart and you'll say, well, I don't really have all, you know, points connecting these different points of the star. I don't have planets in those particular right. points. Right. But, hey, if you live a certain, to a certain age, you're likely, I've seen this over and over again, you're likely to have the star hit not just one planet, but two points of the star hit two planets at the exact same time in your life or sometimes with people three points. And I'll get to that part of their life when I'll say, gee, this star was, the Capricorn star was hitting your uh, Jupiter and the um, Aries star was hitting your Mercury and the Gemini star was hitting your Venus or your Sun, let's say, and uh, something must have really taken place. And that's in an eight year period because the pentagram of Venus, those degrees, are usually good for about eight years. And I'll say something like, wow, this must have been a really big time of your life, very incredible that you would have three hits on the star in this particular uh, few year period. Mm -hmm. And that's usually the response is, oh yes, everything happened in my oh. life at oh. that time that influenced my life, that put me on the road that I'm on now, that changed everything for me, That. Wow, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And you can tie that back to the date and see exactly when it was. Mm -hmm. When you think of someone like, um, you mentioned Oprah earlier, when you think of someone like Oprah, obviously she's a hard-working individual, but a lot of what happened to her you think is based on her alignment of this Kazemi and her chart whereby she was sort of gifted with this sort of uh, destiny of sorts, would you call it? Or? I would call it a destiny, mm -hmm. for sure. She was born at that Venus Kazemi, very powerful in Aquarius. She has been the queen of the airwaves. She surpassed, broken and surpassed every record on the books for, um, you know, 
not and just the women. Were, the odds were stacked against her. I mean, being a woman, being a exactly. black woman. From a poor... From uh, a poor part of the country in the South that she didn't really have any advantages, special advantages or opportunities when she was growing up. This was her talent, her what she came in with at birth, her mm -hmm. destiny, you could call it. But there it was, Sun, Venus, and the Venus Star Point, the Triple Crown, all lined up at nine degrees Aquarius at the time of her birth. And there are similar figures to that that I've looked at that maybe had better advantages growing up, but still became, you know, just shot into the stratosphere of, you know, incredible talent. It does make you wonder. I mean, you have to stop and think about, you know, we all know that astrology is about timing, obviously, and that's the basis of the whole astrological concept. But when you see someone such as she, you can't help but uh, mm -hmm. uh, wonder, uh, you know, what, what right. was that working? I mean, she obviously had to do her work, but you know, she really was at the right place at the right time. Well, we're all doing our work. We're all hardworking in the in the sense of things. But but then you think, okay, but but she really did that. So another person born at the same time as her. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what's interesting? Exactly four years later, when the Venus Kazemi came back to Aquarius. And almost on the same date, maybe a couple days later, but four years later, on that Kazemi, Ellen DeGeneres was born. Interesting. Who's another major media presence. Very interesting. And both of them broke major records. I mean, when you think about the fact that it was Aquarius, it wasn't just that they were women and they broke through a lot of glass ceilings in the broadcasting, Oprah for sure in the broadcasting, industry and talk shows and all of that and media empire that she's um, hmm. wow. inherited. But Ellen um, had a similar kind of um, leadership quality breakthrough when she openly announced that she was gay. Mm -hmm. She was the first major TV personality to announce that. And I think maybe at first it didn't really exactly work in her favor maybe there was you know some backlash to that but it didn't take long for her realizing that coming out with who her her real self who she was now the difference between Oprah and Ellen is that Oprah is an evening star and Ellen is a morning star and I often use this example when I'm talking about it because morning and evening are running on two they have almost two different types of machines that are driving them. Uh, that makes perfect sense because of the timing and, and where they were born. Mm -hmm. And so, but the fact that the two of them, and of course the four and the four makes the eight, which gives you that same cycle, that is phenomenal to me. I didn't realize that about Ellen. That is really right. a perfect example of what it would, you know, um, Right. Be that right. same mathematical precision. Right. Wow, and it's amazing. We've been talking today with uh, Ariel Gutman. She's the author of Venus Star Rising. We had her on earlier to talk about the particular Venus Star Rising as well. But more, more importantly, we were talking about the, the logic and the geometry of the universe, which is much of which is explained in this book, uh, Venus Star Rising. I encourage you to look up her uh, website, which is on the screen up there. We'll see her name come up. And uh, she can do a fascinating reading and show you where your Venus Star points are in your life and hopefully you can use them to um, your great advantage. I think you'll find creative people have this, as you mentioned. I think Oprah and Ellen DeGeneres are fascinating uh, examples of that. So it's oh, been really great. Oh, and there's hundreds of others. Sure I are. just, at the top of my head, I'm like, It's been great okay. to have you on. Thank you <laughs> Thank so much. Thank you so much <laughs> for having me. Great. Thank you.